Imagine the audacious act of selling an imaginary airport for a staggering $242 million. How does one even conceive such a notion? We've all encountered our fair share of spam emails, with Nigeria being notorious for a particular brand of scam. You receive an email from someone claiming to be royalty, a doctor, or a bank manager, asserting the existence of a massive fortune. They seek your assistance in transferring this wealth to your country, promising you a substantial cut. The catch? A small upfront payment to supposedly verify your bank account before the millions start flowing in. It's a classic email scam, but the story I'm about to share predates the internet era making those modern scammers seem like amateurs compared to the Nigerian king of swindlers we're about to delve into. Back in 1995, the manager of Brazil's Bank of Noroeste received a call from the governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria. Imagine the gravity of receiving such a call. It's not every day that a central bank governor contacts you. The Brazilian bank manager tuned in attentively as the governor began telling him that Nigeria had grand plans to build an airport in its capital city, Abuja, a bustling metropolis with a sizable population. Sensing a golden opportunity, the Brazilian bank manager leaned in. The governor continued revealing that Nigeria was on the lookout for investors to fund this airport venture, estimating the total cost at around $250 million. And this offer was extended to banks worldwide, and the urgency in the governor's voice hinted that time was of the essence to miss this chance and another bank might swoop in. The Brazilian bank manager, well aware of the profitability of major airport projects, saw this as an irresistible opportunity. After all, a decent-sized airport could recoup the initial investment within a year or two. While the Brazilian bank manager was contemplating this lucrative prospect, the governor dropped another bombshell as the intermediary facilitating this deal. The bank manager was promised a commission of $10 million. In the end, after some negotiation, the Brazilian bank manager sealed the deal with the Nigerian central bank governor, and he declared officially setting the wheels in motion for what would turn out to be a wild ride in the world of high-stakes deception. The director of the Brazilian bank remained blissfully unaware that he wasn't conversing with the central bank of Nigeria's governor, but with a man named Emmanuel Nwood. Emmanuel had no legitimate business involving an airport. So, who was Emmanuel Nwood, and how did he orchestrate this colossal scam? Emmanuel Nwood also held a directorial position, but not at a state bank. He was associated with the Union Bank of Nigeria, a private commercial bank. Though comfortable financially, Emmanuel harbored grand ambitions for wealth, craving millions beyond his current status. This yearning birth had a wild idea, seeking investments to construct an airport in Nigeria's capital. Despite having a reputable position in banking, Emmanuel knew his standing wasn't enough for such an audacious scam. He decided to impersonate Paul Agbai Ogwuma, the governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria. Emmanuel meticulously devised a plan, assembling a team of five individuals close to him, all experienced in financial and banking systems. With their insider knowledge, they delved into discussions on how to lure a bank into investing in a fictitious airport project. This group, led by Emmanuel, had in-depth knowledge of banks and their operations both in Nigeria and internationally. Armed with personal and private information about influential figures in the financial sector, their plan commenced with sending faxes to various commercial banks globally. Crafted in an official and professional tone, these letters purported to be from the Director of Financial Planning and Budgeting at the Nigerian Ministry Ministry of Aviation. This imaginary persona served a crucial role, as the letter claimed that the Nigerian Ministry of Aviation sought investments for a substantial airport project in the capital Abuja. The story gained credibility due to Abuja's recent declaration as Nigeria's new capital in 1991, with the government actively pursuing development projects in the city. Each message sent to foreign banks, tailored to the specific institution and country, conveyed the same narrative with minor adjustments. For instance, the message sent to Nelson Sakaguchi, the Japanese-rooted bank manager at the Brazilian Noroeste Bank, caught his attention. The official letter, seemingly from the Nigerian Ministry of Aviation, intrigued Sakaguchi, as his bank was already exploring investment opportunities in foreign development projects. The letter's legitimacy received an additional boost when transmitted from a number belonging to the Nigerian government. Emmanuel and his group, leveraging their connections and relationships in Nigeria's financial sector, even utilized a government-owned fax machine to enhance the believability of their scheme. Sakaguchi, swayed by the letter, responded expressing interest in the investment opportunity, eager to delve deeper into the discussion. Emmanuel's tricky plan took another step as they decided to meet face to face. Sakaguchi suggested meeting in Nigeria or Brazil, but Emmanuel wanted to keep the whole project secret. Emmanuel said they wouldn't start building the airport for another four or five years, so it was better to keep things quiet. He suggested a private meeting away from Nigeria and Brazil. When Sakaguchi mentioned he had a job in London, Emmanuel agreed, and they set the meeting there. A week later, Emmanuel and his team got ready for the big meeting. Each person pretended to be someone important. Emmanuel acted as the central bank governor, another as the deputy governor, and another as the director of the Ministry of Aviation. 
With fake documents and plans for an airport that didn't exist, they were all set for their tricky plan. They chose London for their meeting, booking a fancy hotel and treating Sakaguchi like a VIP with a limousine and the best room. During the meeting, they used fake names and made up stories. Sakaguchi couldn't check things online back then, so he believed everything they said. Emmanuel even showed him fake pictures of him with the Nigerian president and prime minister, adding more lies about airport plans and where the land was supposed to be. Emmanuel stressed the need for secrecy, saying the airport project wouldn't start for a few years. But he also insisted they needed money right away to hire companies and get tools. Sakaguchi started getting suspicious, but Emmanuel dismissed his worries and promised him a $10 million commission. Feeling pressured and tempted by the big commission, Sakaguchi reluctantly agreed to invest. Emmanuel sensed victory, knowing Sakaguchi had fallen into the trap. The deal they made in London had the Brazilian bank putting in a massive $242 million in 1995. Before ending the London meeting, Emmanuel convinced Sakaguchi to send a $3 million deposit as proof they were serious about the investment. Sakaguchi, feeling trapped, made the payment, not realizing the trouble he was in. For the next three years, from 1995 to 1998, Sakaguchi kept sending millions to Emmanuel. Fearful of losing the opportunity and holding on to hope, didn't tell his bank's bosses about the scam. To avoid suspicion, he kept each money transfer under $6 million so he didn't need board approval. He also sent the money to different countries and banks Emmanuel and his team were using in Nigeria. In this way, Sakaguchi unknowingly sent a whopping $242 million to Emmanuel and his group, all while his bank's bosses had no clue about the tricky scam happening right under their noses. During this time, Emmanuel continued his deceit by sending false documents, pictures, and contracts to Sakaguchi. These were meant to convince Sakaguchi that the airport project was still in progress. Emmanuel and his crew, all with a background in banking, invested the money they received. They purchased real estate in Nigeria and other parts of the world and bought shares in various companies. The whole operation stayed hidden, and it might have remained so for a long time if an unexpected event hadn't occurred. Santander Bank, the largest bank in Spain, expressed interest in acquiring Noroest Bank. The bank's management, including Sakaguchi, initially approved the offer. However, before the acquisition process could proceed, a board was formed with representatives from both banks to review all assets and documents. To their surprise, discovered that about a third of Norosta Bank's capital was missing, and Sakaguchi was summoned to explain this gap to the board. During the meeting, Sakaguchi confessed that he made a massive investment deal with the Nigerian government, and he transferred $242 million over the past three years without informing the board. The board was skeptical, finding it hard to believe that Sakaguchi, who had faithfully managed the bank for 14 years, would make such a huge decision without their knowledge. An investigation committee was formed to look into the matter. After extensive efforts to trace the complex network of money transfers across various countries and banks, the committee found that all roads led to Nigeria. The problem, however, was Nigeria's lack of effective financial controls. The investigation committee struggled to uncover the true identities of the individuals who received the money in Nigeria. The case took a long time until Nigerian banks, under pressure from Western banks, especially Swiss banks, cooperated in revealing the true identities of the account owners. Eventually, the committee identified Emmanuel and his crew. However, they faced another challenge. Nigeria lacked laws against financial fraud. Emmanuel and his group remained free in Nigeria, potentially having bribed officials to disregard any Western claims for their arrest or investigation. Meanwhile, the Brazilian bank Noroest was sold to the Spanish Santander Bank. Sakaguchi faced trial in Switzerland on charges of financial fraud and money laundering resulting in a prison sentence of several years. During the bank's crisis, owners globally hired lawyers to recover losses from a fraud in Nigeria. The government's initial reluctance changed when President Olusegun Obasanjo took office in 2003, establishing the EFCC to combat financial crimes. In 2004, EFCC investigated Emmanuel's gang, resulting in arrests. Despite Emmanuel's efforts, he eventually agreed to return $120 million and pay a $10 million fine. He served less than two years of a five-year sentence and used legal tactics to reclaim $50 million in properties and continues his comfortable life in his luxurious estates. Please like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon for more channel updates. Thank you for watching.